This is a podcast produced by Visionaries Norway. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our second season in this podcast series produced by Visionaries Norway. My name is Thomas Tvet, and I'm the one recording and producing these episodes. As usual, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, feel free to follow us on Facebook or contact us through our webpage at www.visionaries.no. In this second season, we're going to dive in and take a look at some topics that we merely scratched in the first season. And first off is two episodes dedicated to the parents of blind children. So you're a parent and you've gotten yourself a blind child. Where do you go from there? Now, this is a huge topic and we're most likely not going to cover everything. But Daniel Kish is here to give you some of the answers. And also, if you find yourself located in Norway, you might want to check out our Kid Visionaries project, which is a project that we're going to start in Norway in 2020, which is a group based workshops where you can come and join us with your kid, uh, where we're going to play and work on mobility skills. Anyway, here's Daniel Kish. I think uh, what I'll do is I'll start by talking about what I would call the basic principles, mm -hmm. the things that underlie um, the specific teachable skills or specific teachable things. You know, sometimes parents, they, they, they kind of want us to come in and just sort of fix it, just kind of make it better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we trust you to teach our child something, that magic special something that will result in our child just functioning better and just, you know, whatever it is that we're expecting uh, of our child to do. And um, so one of the first principles I'd like to say is that uh, the parents and or family um, are the most important and most effective instructors mm -hmm. of children. Um, I, if I instruct a child, what I do for that child accounts for maybe, oh gosh, maybe 10% of the impact that could happen for that child. The rest of it really comes from the dynamic of the parents and family. And one of the reasons for this is that the family is the blueprint for the blueprint that helps to form our relationship with our community. And relationship with the community is really what we're aiming for. It's really what we're after. I mean, <laughs> what, are, what are we teaching our children to, to do? What are we hoping our children become? We're hoping our children become effective participants in, in the community, society. Yeah. in society. That's right. So the family represents society. The family is a child's society. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, as children grow, I, I, I tend to, to very broadly and generally think of development in stages of three. So it's kind of birth to three, you know, is you're very, very... It's very family focused, very parent focused. Um, it's all about the the mommy, the the daddy, the the brothers and sisters, and and this is my home, and this is what I call family. Um, and then, roughly three to six, whoa, we're starting to broaden our view uh, of who our people are. We start to, to have friends. We start school uh, or uh, 
daycare, uh, we start paying more attention to friends of the family or maybe extended family. Um, it's just a broader sense of what our community is. And then six to nine, well, six to nine, we're starting uh, to be more aware of friends outside of home. These are my school friends. These are people I know that may not even have much to do with my family or my home. And then nine to 12, more the same, but now, you know, ideally we're starting to maybe spend more time away from home with our friends. Maybe we do sleepovers. Maybe we do possibly trips to the store. You know, we, we start to begin having outings with our friends. Uh, maybe we're spending more time in extracurricular activities. Um, and then 12 to 15 or so, uh, you know, now we're spending more time in the community. We're spending more time, uh, you know, whatever you're going, going shopping or doing sports with our friends or yeah, that starts to become the time where we hardly see our kids sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, 15 to 18 is when uh, a lot of people maybe start to drive or they're using public transportation freely and openly and they're just gone. They just take off and they're, you know, they're almost, they almost embrace the whole sat town or city or village or community. And then at 18 to 21, they're either leaving home or thinking about leaving home. And maybe they go to university, they start, to, and it goes on from there. I mean, it just goes on and on from there. So, so when I look at the development of any child, blind, sighted, autistic, or whatever, <clears throat> whatever or whomever it may be, I kind of use that rule of three as a, a bit of a touchstone for where that child is developmentally. Not that children must fall into that rule of three, but if, for example, a child is nine years old and still doesn't think outside of their home or outside of oh. their... That's what I'm saying. That's where I look at it and think, no, you know, what's keeping this from happening? Why... What are the effects? What is affecting the development of the child? Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I mention it to parents because very often it, it can be easy to fall into what's easy. It's yeah. easy to keep a blind child home, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. It's easy to create barriers between them and their friends, the big bad sighted kids. It's easy to put walls between them and their community. And so it can happen without us even being conscious of how it's happening. I'll, I'll give one example. I was in Austria and I uh, went to one of their, uh, I think they call it the Chris Kringlemart, the Christmas um, festivals mm -hmm. that they have there, fascinating things. And they're fun, you know, and they, they, you know, they're activities for the kids and, and, and for the parents and, uh, lots of different things going on. And I went with the father of one of our students. She was at home and, and he just came kind of as a just to show, this was our first trip to Austria. So he thought, he thought we'd be interested. So he came to show us what this is all about. And, and uh, Juan was with me, one of our instructors, and we were just having a good time with it. Juan was not living in Austria at the time. And so we, we you know, the nativity scene was cool and the Christmas punch was cool and watching all the different things that kids were doing and the families and the music. It was a festival, okay? Mm -hmm. Typical European festival. Uh, and so we had a good time of it. And at the end, now this man's daughter uh, was, I think, seven at the time. And he, and she had a twin uh, sister. And at the end of it, he said something like, I'm ashamed to say that I never thought to bring my daughter hmm. to one of these. Which, 
everyone comes to these festivals. I mean, it's just a thing. You just you just go as a family. You just go and, and you bring your kids. And, you know, there were kids there who were two and three years old and they were doing two and three year old things that you would do um, at these festivals. And he just never thought to bring his blind daughter mm. to the festival. And he wasn't even sure why. Um, and the more he thought about it, the more he thought, well, it doesn't make sense. But somehow in his mind, it just wasn't somehow appropriate to bring his blind daughter mm -hmm. to the festival. And we do this in so many subtle and not so subtle ways with our blind kids. And sometimes our sighted kids, too. But we're talking about blind kids. And this is what I see a lot is various forms of isolation or exclusion. Mm -hmm. um, and it's often under the guise of protection, of sheltering, of being on pins and needles, we would say, having angst about what might happen to my blind child if. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, uh, the idea of our family being the blueprint of our community uh, obviously has many, many different dimensions and many different implications and one of them is being very careful to 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 preserve and foster relationships both uh, natural relationships both within the family and outside the family so I, I kind of spoke about outside the family first because I, I talked about development, but inside the family is also very important. So often I ask parents, how much freedom do you want for your child? It's one of the first questions I often ask. How much freedom do you want for your child? Mm -hmm. And that often gives parents pause for thought. Parents, if you're listening now, I would ask you, how much freedom do you want for your child? And if you think about this for a moment, I will tell you how much freedom you want for your child because I've asked this question hundreds of times and I almost always get a similar answer. I, I want my child to have all the freedom they can. Very, very yes. rarely do you get a parent who says, you know, no, I don't, I don't really want freedom for my child. I mean, that's just a lot to ask. And you know, they, they just kind of say, well, I, uh, we want freedom for our child. Okay. Then what must happen? What must be in play for freedom to happen? Mm -hmm. Well, a child needs to be able to, first of all, imagine to, to have ideas about their own freedom, to have the same dreams as other people, to have the same desires and interests as other people, and to expect that other people, society, community, will have the same respect for their desires and their dreams that they would have for anyone else. In other words, essentially, that our children are to be regarded are, are to be regarded as equal citizens, citizens equal to everyone else, and regard themselves as being equal citizens to everyone else. So for that, we have to, they, they, they need to be able to execute their own freedom of choice, their own freedom of purpose. We often call it self-directed achievement, mm -hmm. the capacity to achieve what you like, when you like, how you like. I mean, that's no less than we'd expect and want for anyone else. So why should, should blind children be any different? So coming back to the family as the basis of community, how a blind child is treated within the family and by the family is going to affect how that blind child gets treated within the community and by the community. because. That's going to depend very much on the ch blind child's view mm -hmm. of their relationship with their community. 
So, in a practical sense, it means including a blind child as much as part of the family as every other child, every other member of the family, that they are an equal member of the family, which means they contribute as much as any other member of the family to the family, and that the same expectations are held of them as would be held for any member of the family. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that we're all the same. We're not all the same. No two people are the same. We're all different. And as such, we, we, we act differently, we respond differently, we, we draw different um, relationships with different people. But the idea of equality, equality of participation, equality of membership must be present for our blind children. So they're not, you know, they're not... Um, we don't make exceptions for what they contribute to the family. Well, my blind child doesn't really have to do the dishes because he's blind and, you know, why should we make him do the dishes or why should we yes. make him help cleaning the floor? Or why should we, why should we make him, why should we not, not uh, have him participate in folding the laundry or bringing groceries in, in from the car or even helping to, to get groceries or helping around the house or doing whatever it is that we expect members of the family to do to support the family. So what you're saying kind of is that the limitations of a blind child is not, does not necessarily come from the blindness as a physical appearance, but more, it's more a social phenomenon that the more the more the parents, for instance, expect from the child, the more the child can do. Yes. The more the child can do and the more the child will expect of him or herself. Yes. And also of the community around them. Mm -hmm. I hold a high uh, esteem for myself. I hold a high esteem for others. I expect to be held in high esteem by others because that's what I will earn. That's what, you know, that's the respect I will earn. So I can only earn respect. I can only earn the respect that I hold for others and that I hold for myself. And so if we hold that same respect for our blind children, we can expect them to hold the same respect for themselves and for others and to then be held in similar respect by others. Now, that's kind of one aspect of the parents and family being the most important instructors for the child. The other aspect of this is that the family really take the lead in instruction. So I, I realize that many families, many parents um, expect professionals to know what's good for your child. Mm -hmm. You know, they're professionals. They're, they're trained to know this. That's okay? what they get paid That's for. That's what they get paid for, right? <laughs> exactly. And there is truth to that. And there's not truth to that. There's this has to be, this is a dynamic relationship. And <clears throat> it may well be that, uh, that a blindness professional is an expert on blindness, let's just say, but the parent is the expert on their child. Mm -hmm. And the child is the expert on themselves. Yes. And that and and no amount of training or preparation by a blindness professional can take the place of the expertise that a parent has on a child and that a child has on themselves. Mm -hmm. So so it's important for parents to respectfully take charge of the educational process and of the process behind 
a child's freedom. Because at the end of the day, you know, when your child is ready to get on with their lives, whatever that may look like, the blindness professional has no responsibility for that. They just move on to the next student. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. We're done with you, on to the next. It's, (laughs) It's the parent, the family, and ultimately the child that has to shoulder the responsibility for the rest of that child's life. Yes. And to entrust that to a professional is folly. Mm-hmm. So don't. That would be my advice. Uh, maintain a friendly, respectful relationship with your professional, but uh, hold the, the, the reins of responsibility for your child, which will then be entrusted to your child. Because at the end of the day, it's your child that's going to be leading his own life. Mm -hmm. Um, So, that's kind of thing one. Um, The next thing I want to say is about development. And and what I'll do here is I'll, I'll talk about principles, and then I'll move on to how does this relate to the specific things that we can maybe teach our children or specific skill areas or what have you. But if we get the principles right, the rest will follow Mm -hmm. uh, relatively naturally and easily. So, um, so bear with me on this. So the other idea is what I call freedom first. So why do, why do people develop? Why do people grow? Why is there development? Why do people grow from babyhood to toddlerhood to school agehood, you know, to teenage to adults? Um, it's related to a question that is often asked of me. When, at what age is it most suitable to start teaching a blind child to get around, let's say? Yes. You know, to be mobile. Mm-hmm. So at what age should they start using a cane? At what age should they maybe start learning echolocation? At what age should they start, should we expect them to start moving around on their own? Should we expect them to start kind of doing things on their own? And I mean, as age appropriate. And to that, I, I, I turn the question to sighted children and I say, well, at what age is it suitable for a sighted child to learn to see? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Or, or for a sighted child to learn to start doing things for themselves. Uh, for a sighted child to start taking control and responsibility uh, of themselves and of their surroundings. And if we think about that, the answer we usually get without even a lot of thought about it is, well, I'm from the beginning. Uh, So sighted children start learning to see from the beginning. They start reaching out. They, you know, they they first, they they just jiggle and wiggle, and then they start getting control of their limbs, and then they start using their limbs to reach things and to manipulate things, and then they start crawling around, and they start, they strive to get control over their environment. And the underlying drive behind all of this, behind establishing our relationship with our environment and our world in our own way, on our own terms, to understand our world, is, I believe, really a drive for personal freedom. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't want to have freedom? I mean, even if you decide not to have freedom, even that's if, also freedom. It's also freedom. <laughs> exactly. You are free to choose to be restricted and constrained, I guess, right? Yes. But we all want that freedom to choose. So freedom, I call it freedom first. It's a freedom first philosophy. Freedom drives development and development seeks freedom. And I believe that this is a fundamental drive. I believe it lies at the very base of our whole organism. 
And I believe that it is no different for blind children than for sighted children. And I believe that we do well as parents, professionals, and society to honor that and to work to preserve that. Often we do not. Often we work in so many ways to limit the freedom of our blind children. We say things like, well, we don't teach cane training until the blind children are six. Okay, so, so you're not allowed the freedom of movement, the freedom to execute personal choice over, through, and around your own environment until you're six? In what universe does that make any sense? So if it were up to me, if I ran the circus, uh, I, you know, the, the kids would be born and they would get a good solid uh, feel of their mothers and fathers and a big kiss hello or whatever, and then they'd be given a cane. Yes. <laughs> Straight out of the womb, pretty much. <laughs> yes. Okay. And then we'd be teaching them to click in parallel with everything we do to teach our children language. Mm -hmm. We make faces, we make funny noises, we do a thousand million things that our children leverage to learn language. Blind children can leverage the learning of making sound to receive information from their environment in much the same way. It is a form of language. Mm -hmm. It is a way of communicating with your environment. In fact, scientists actually call it interrogating the environment. Scientists who study bats, who use echolocation, call it interrogating the environment. That's exactly what our blind children can learn to do. Mm -hmm. Very, very young. And as for using a cane, I won't go into the details about that, but basically one of our first reflex reflexes uh, of newborns is the grasping reflex. Yeah. If you put a cane into a newborn's hand, they will grasp it. And then of course they'll put it straight into their mouth. So, I mean, you know, it, you, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. Um, but that's what they'll do. And they, and so that's the beginnings of manipulation. So, Freedom first. So we honor freedom first. We honor a blind child's need, which is absolutely no less than a sighted child's, and one might even argue in a way greater than a sighted child's, to establish direct physical interaction with the environment on one's own terms. If a blind child does not have control over their interaction with the environment, they cannot learn. From their environment. I mean, at least a sighted child has the option of kind of looking around, even if they don't understand what they're seeing. They at least have the option of, 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 of information flooding into their brain. Mm -hmm. A blind child doesn't have that particular window to the world. What a blind child has is movement and touch and hearing and the ability to make connections within the environment by physically and tangibly and concretely interacting with the environment. They, it is a must. So one of the things I say about blind children is um, blind children learn by doing. Mm -hmm. uh, blind children must do what they cannot see. It is the doing of a blind child that is they're seeing. And we know this scientifically now, that the visual cortex of a blind child becomes recruited in the physical activities in which a blind child participates. Mm -hmm. The active participation in the physical environment through echolocation and through touch is what recruits the visual cortex of a blind child. When you do not have that active, that actively dynamic participation, you don't see 
the same activity in the visual cortex of a blind well, a blind adult. We haven't really studied that in blind children because you can't stuff blind children into an MRI machine. <laughs> yeah. But you can adults, and we have, and that's what we see. So, okay, that's freedom first. Now, the next two principles I'll get into are, one is, a, they're both principles of development, but one is also a principle of, of neuroscience. And it's the first principle of neuroscience, use it or lose it. So the brain is a bit like a muscle. In fact, it's a lot like a muscle. And if I ask you, if you want your muscles to be stronger, what must you do? Uh, go to the gym. Yeah, go to the gym. Exercise. Use your muscles. Use them. The more you use them, the stronger they get. Mm -hmm. The more toned they become. The healthier you become. And if we don't use them, we lose them. Mm -hmm. Either our muscles atrophy or we get fat or unhealthy in some other way. Mm -hmm. So the brain is just the same. There are real, concrete, tangible, physical, actual, solid mechanisms in the brain that control everything we do, that, that, that manage everything we do. And that includes freedom of movement, navigation, mapping of space, thinking, understanding, uh, directing our movements through space. There are actual mechanisms that control all, the, all of those things. In order for those mechanisms to develop, they must be used, and they must be used actively and with intention, back to self-directed achievement. If we don't have active, intentional application of these mechanisms, they just don't develop. They just, they either atrophy or they just kind of stay stagnant. Um, there was a study done on London taxi drivers uh, of their brains. London is notoriously difficult to get around. Mm -hmm. And they took these taxi drivers who know London and they can get around London and they studied their brains as compared to, I guess, non-taxi drivers. And they found that there were certain areas of the brain that were responsible for mapping and navigation, particularly the, hipp the hippocampus, uh, that was measurably much enlarged, bigger than the typical hippocampus of a normal person and <clears throat> so all right so these hippocampi were very large in these london taxi drivers then what happens if we measure them at a time when they haven't been driving their taxis maybe they've retired or they've taken another job and what we find is the hippocampi of these ta taxi drivers uh reduced in size so, you know, it's a very clear example of use it or lose it. And you can, it is only through intentional action that these brain mechanisms uh, develop. And so when our blind children are, are overly supported, when they are excluded from activity, when things are done for them, when their affairs are managed for them, when they are managed through their environment by others, when they are overly guided by others, physically or verbally, what mechanisms of the brain are not in use? And the answer is all of those mechanisms responsible for self-directed navigation and self-directed action. Mm -hmm. So don't do that. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not saying we don't support our children. We, we support all parents support their children. But for a sighted child, we expect our sighted children to walk. We expect our sighted children to run. The first steps a sighted child took were probably steps toward us while we awaited them with arms open mm -hmm. to catch them if they fall 
but expecting them to walk on their own. And we catalyze this, the, the growth of our sighted children by systematically withdrawing our support mm. from them. That's basically how this is done. This is often not done for blind children. Blind children are often overly supported. They're moved through space. Things are brought to them or they are brought to things. And so the process of this self-leveraging of personal effectiveness, personal capacity, becomes short-circuited. So that's the first thing, or the, well, the, the first developmental principle. The second developmental principle is need drives learning. Mm -hmm. So in English, we'd have an expression, necessity is the mother of, in of invention. If you need something, you invent a way to address that need. If you need to learn something, you find a way to learn it. If a blind child always has someone doing for them, if a blind child always has a hand to hold or an arm to hold or is always moved through life, what need have they to learn to do those things themselves? Hmm. They don't. They don't. They don't have it. So it doesn't happen. And I get the age appropriate thing. I mean, every parent's going to hold their three year old hand, their, their three years old hands. It's just natural. It's, it makes sense. It's age appropriate, whatever. I'm just here to say that if you hold the hand of a sighted child and they're three and they're four and they're five, at some point the sighted child's just going to let go. They're just going to let go because of those stages of development I talked about earlier. At some point between the age of six and on. nine, they move on. They move on. Development drives them to move on. A blind child won't let go. They won't let go unless that is our expectation. Right. And to bring about that expectation, we must, in a very similar way, withdraw our support. We let go. And if we let go they let go. So, um, so that's one of the biggest applications of need drives development. So we basically have parents are the most important instructors, families form the blueprint of our community, of a child's community, uh, the stages of development, the rule of three. We have freedom is first, because freedom drives development. Development isn't driven by contrivances. We don't arbitrarily decide when a child gets to be free. That's <laughs> who decides that. Freedom is going to drive that developmental process if we allow it and respect it to happen. And then we have, of course, uh, use it or lose it. We must respect the brain's capacity to grow to grow those mechanisms that need to grow for freedom of movement and freedom of choice to happen. And need drives the learning process. If you don't need it, you won't learn it. So we do our children a great favor when we respect the needs to grow into an equal citizen and to one who has the drive for uh, the healthy drive for self-directed achievement toward personal freedom you have listened to a podcast produced by visionaries norway please follow us on facebook or check out our webpage at www.visionaries.no if you have any feedback or want to support the work that we do Thank you for listening.